Let's talk about the two-state solution. Israel living alongside the new state of Palestine. It's long been seen as the answer, but remains elusive. With the war in Gaza, it's back in the headlines. The only real solution is a two-state solution over time. A lasting end to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict can only come through a two-state solution. A future in which two states live side by side in peace and security. So what do people actually mean when they talk about a two-state solution? How long has the idea been around? And why do some people think that it's become more of an avoidance strategy that lets politicians off the hook? They use this as a tool to absolve themselves of responsibility. It's a form of escapism. The two-state solution is all about deciding how this land is divided, who lives there, and who controls it. Now, you might think it's about getting Israelis and Palestinians to agree on a simple split, but there's nothing simple about it. Just look at the map for a start. This is Israel. And then you have the Palestinian territories, which are under Israeli military occupation and cut off from each other. Gaza's here. Israel's war has left the Strip in ruins, and the West Bank is more like a patchwork of Palestinian land because of all the settlements Israel has built over the years. These are illegal under international law. There are now 700,000 Israeli settlers living on Palestinian land, and it makes the path to a Palestinian state much more complicated. If this was meant to be a question of two states, and if it was a question of drawing a border, believe me, a border would have been drawn a long time ago. The problem is, is that this has never been about a line. It's about the rights of individuals. It's about history. The region of Palestine has been fought over for thousands of years and controlled by different ancient kingdoms and empires. In more modern times, it was part of the Ottoman Empire, but the British took control there during the First World War and it later became known as British Mandate Palestine. The population was 78% Muslim, 11% Jewish, and 10% Christian, according to a census in 1922. Now, even before they took control, the British supported the idea of establishing a Jewish homeland in Palestine. It was stated in a letter known as the Balfour Declaration. And the Jews were promised a national home in Palestine. That was the aim of a movement called Zionism. It encouraged Jews to move to British Mandate Palestine, and in the 1920s and 30s, more and more did. Many were fleeing persecution in Europe. But the growing Jewish population led to tension with the local Arab population, the Palestinians. Jewish and Arab armed groups cropped up, and there was violence. In response, a British commission suggested partitioning the land, but there was no support for the idea. The scheme to divide the country between Arabs and Jews has pleased nobody in Palestine. And agitation has fermented discontent to the point of terrorism. In the 1940s, the question of what should happen in Palestine grew more urgent. So did pressure to establish a Jewish homeland, especially after World War II and the Holocaust. In 1947, the British asked the United Nations to make recommendations on the future government of Palestine. And this is what they came up with. Another partition plan, which allocated 56% of the land to a Jewish state and left 43% for an Arab state. The remaining land, including Jerusalem with all of its holy sites, would be under international control. The UN General Assembly voted to adopt the plan Jewish leaders accepted it, but Arab leaders rejected it. They saw it as deeply unfair, especially because the Arab population was the majority. The following year, Israel went ahead and declared itself a state, and five Arab nations went to war with Israel. Israel calls it their war of independence. Palestinians call it the Nakba, which means catastrophe, because in that fighting, more than 700,000 Palestinians fled or were forced from their homes. Many ended up in Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. By the way, that's important to know about because when people talk about a future Palestinian state, one of the big questions is whether all those Palestinians and their descendants will get to go back, what's called the right of return. Now, after the 1948 war, Israel ended up with 78% of the land, so more than the UN partition plan. That left 22% for Palestinians to live in, split between the West Bank and East Jerusalem, which Jordan controlled, and Gaza, which Egypt controlled. Those borders became known as the Green Line, 
there is still the internationally recognized borders of Israel, and it's more or less the division that many people have in mind when talking about a two-state solution. But then, in 1967, there was another war. Israel pushed out Jordan and Egypt, seized control of the West Bank, East Jerusalem and Gaza, and imposed a military occupation. Many, many, many countries then started to put pressure on Palestinians to say, you must recognize Israel's existence. You have to recognize that Israel took over 78% of your historic homeland. And instead, let's try to get back that remaining 22%. The Palestinian side, the idea of territorial partition was very, very difficult. Uh, but by the 1970s, there are some who are pushing, saying, you know, look, we're never going to get all of historic Palestine. We can build a state on a portion of liberated Palestine. And in 1988, there was an official shift. By that point, the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, had become the main group representing Palestinians and their cause. Its chairman, Yasser Arafat, declared the independence of Palestine. And although the declaration was mostly symbolic, it was important because Arafat also made it clear that he accepted the principle of partition and the existence of Israel. That helped pave the way for the Oslo Accords, a pair of agreements which are seen as the beginning of the peace process. It started out with secret talks in Norway's capital. That's where the name comes from. And it led to this moment. The Israeli and Palestinian leaders shaking hands on the White House lawn. After decades of fighting, they declared their commitment to peaceful coexistence. So what were the details of Oslo? Well, in the first agreement in 1993, the two sides formally recognized each other, which was a big deal. They set out a timetable for Israel to start withdrawing from parts of the occupied territories and for Palestinians to get more autonomy. That led to the creation of the Palestinian Authority, or PA. Although its power was, and still is, limited, it's more like a local council than a government. And the PA only operates in parts of the Palestinian territory because in the second Oslo agreement, the West Bank was carved up into three administrative areas. What the peace process was all about was not about Israel accepting the 78% and letting Palestinians live freely in the remaining 22%. Instead, what it was about was Israel takes the 78%, puts it in its pocket, and then negotiates over the remaining 22%. Now, the Oslo Accords were interim arrangements. They were only supposed to last five years. And in that time, the two sides were meant to negotiate the really tough stuff, what are called the permanent status issues. So things like how to share Jerusalem. The city has huge religious importance for both sides, and they both see it as their capital. The issue of Palestinian refugees and whether they get the right of return we mentioned earlier. What to do about all the Israeli settlements, security arrangements, and where you draw those final borders. So Oslo looked like it was heading in the direction of a two-state solution, but it wasn't actually spelled out. The Oslo Accords are sometimes remembered as having um, sort of promised a two-state solution. That is absolutely and completely false. It's very, very important carefully drafted in order to avoid mentioning anything about Palestinian statehood. Still, the two sides were talking to each other. There was a lot of diplomacy going on, and many people felt optimistic about it. There were a lot of peace conferences on all kinds of levels, grassroots, politicians, journalists, artists. There was a hope in the air. But there was opposition to the peace process too, on both sides. In Israel, there were big protests against Oslo. Close to half of the society that said, we're not on board with this process. We're talking to terrorists, this is going to uh, mean Israeli withdrawal from territory that is an essential part of the land of Israel. In 1995, a Jewish nationalist who rejected the peace process assassinated Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. So very early on, one of the main architects of the Oslo Accords was gone. There was also opposition on the Palestinian side for lots of reasons. There are many Palestinians still, and they were also in the late 90s, who didn't agree with the path of Arafat, namely that uh, the Palestinians should recognize the state of Israel. 
There are many Palestinians who believe that all Palestine belongs to the Palestinian people. Israel took it from them in 48, and they feel that there is no room for compromise. That was the position of some armed groups like Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, who carried out attacks on Israel. There were also Palestinians who opposed Oslo because of their frustration about how little it was delivering. Israel never fully withdrew from the territory it promised, and it kept building settlements. We'll come back to that in a minute. At least part of the Palestinians felt that they are cheated. That this was a cover for effective Israeli annexation. Just a complete disillusionment with diplomacy, a complete disillusionment with negotiations with the, with, with the Oslo process and, and, and so on. By the end of the 90s, Oslo's five-year time frame was up and the peace process was basically on life support. There was a push to save it at Camp David, the U.S. president's country retreat. How is it going, Mr. President? How long is it going to take, Mr. President? We pledged to each other we would answer no questions and offer no comments. But the summit ended without an agreement. And if anything, there was more distrust as both sides blamed each other for the failure. Soon after that, Frustration and anger boiled over. The trigger was this visit by a senior Israeli politician to the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound in East Jerusalem, a super inflammatory move. Check out our episode on Al-Aqsa if you want to understand why. There were riots, and it led to an uprising known as the Second Intifada. Palestinians staged huge protests. Some carried out attacks on Israel, and Israel used heavy military force against Palestinians. It was more than four years of intense conflict. And all the peace efforts just were burning in the fire of the Intifada. But they weren't completely extinguished. There were many more attempts over the years to get the peace process back on track. And the two-state solution became the stated goal of all that diplomacy. They begin to say maybe one of the problems with Oslo is it didn't spell out any end. So let's spell something out. Let's give something to the Palestinians. Um, and this is when you begin to have open declarations from the United States that there should be an entity called Palestine at the end. But while the international community seemed to be doubling down on the two-state idea, there were other developments pulling momentum in the opposite direction. Let's run through three major ones, starting with settlements, which Israel kept on expanding even during the height of the peace process. It was as though the Oslo agreements gave Israel the green light to build and expand settlements. With the thinking being, and they used to say this, we have to take every hilltop and then we can negotiate down. And, and that's why between the years of 1993 to the year 2000, that's why we saw virtually a doubling in the number of settlers from 200,000 to almost 400,000. Once you're not ready to freeze the settlements, you give the message that you don't agree to a Palestinian state. Because if you have an intention to continue to build on Palestinian ground, so for sure you have no intention to evacuate it. Then there's the way that politics on both sides have developed since the early 2000s. On the Israeli side, there's been a strong shift to the right and fewer politicians who back the two-state idea. An ultra-nationalist ideology that was once thought of as extreme has now become part of the mainstream. Settlers who openly call for the full annexation of all Palestinian territory are government ministers. And in a speech at the UN, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu held up a map of Israel that covered the whole land. On the Palestinian side, the challenge is more about who actually speaks for the Palestinian people because it's not that clear. You've got the PLO, which still represents Palestinians internationally. Arafat was the chairman, but he died in a suspected poisoning in 2004 and was replaced by Mahmoud Abbas. Abbas is also the president of the PA. But the PA doesn't operate in Gaza anymore, because after elections in 2006, Hamas ended up in control there. So Palestinian leadership is already split. And then there are bigger questions around legitimacy. There haven't been elections since that vote in 2006. These days, Abbas is pretty unpopular. He's seen as old and out of touch, and the PA is accused of being corrupt and working too closely with Israel. Palestinian Authority not only 
does not have any um, uh, credibility and does no longer has any capacity. It's virtually disintegrating in the West Bank. On the other hand, polls show that Hamas and its leader Ismail Haniyeh are more popular than Mahmoud Abbas. But several countries classify Hamas as a terrorist organization and refuse to recognize it as a representative of Palestinians. So where has all of this left the peace process? Well, dead, basically. The last time there were direct negotiations about a two-state solution was in 2014, during the Obama administration, so a decade ago. You need uh, credible leaders in Israel and Palestine, which we, we don't have. You need serious mediation from outside, which we don't have. And you need a mobilized uh, regional and global public opinion to support the two negotiating parties. But it's nowhere on the horizon right now. This is where the U.S. also comes in for a lot of criticism. Because while it's always had an important role as a mediator, the U.S. is also Israel's biggest ally and protector. The Americans have such a leverage over Israel. We study it politically, economically, diplomatically, internationally, and obviously uh, militarily, totally dependent on the United States. They never really took measures to push Israel. They just, you know, condemned Israel. With talkings, you don't get anything. And then there's everything that's happened since October 7th, 2023. Around 1,200 people were killed in Hamas's attacks on Israel. That's according to the Israeli authorities. In response, Israel vowed to wipe out Hamas. Its war on Gaza has killed more than 31,000 Palestinians, most of them women and children. The UN's highest court said there's a plausible risk of genocide. And against that horrifying backdrop, talk of the two-state solution is back. It's once again being presented as the only option for lasting peace by a range of world leaders and organizations. The United States continues to believe that the best viable path, indeed the only path, is through a two-state solution. Должны быть все-таки имплементированы решения ООН по поводу создания палестинского государства со столицей восточном Иерусалиме. What's the Palestinian position? Well, the two-state solution remains the stated goal of the PLO. Hamas's position is less clear. In 2017, they published a document that did accept the formation of a Palestinian state along the 1967 borders. Some took it to mean that Hamas was open to diplomacy. But Hamas has never explicitly recognized Israel, and it maintains its right to use violence against the occupation. As for Israel's current position, well, officials from the prime minister down have repeatedly rejected the idea of a two-state solution. Is there still a chance for a two-state solution? I think it's about time for the world to realize the Oslo paradigm failed on the 7th but, of October and we need to build a new one. And in but, order to build a new one... does that new one include the Palestinians living in a state of their own. Is, think, is that what it includes? I think the biggest question is, what type of Palestinians are on the other side? This is what Israel no, realized in 7th of October. Though? The answer is absolutely no one. It's not that the two-state solution is absolutely, utterly, forever impossible. It's just politically very, very unlikely and would require such a coincidence of interest and political determination that its likelihood is extremely slim. So there's a lot of skepticism. Plus, there's an accusation that all the talk of a two-state solution is actually part of the problem. Those words have become the fig leaf. It's become a way of placating Palestinians. I heard it's very convenient to believe that there is a solution somewhere on the, on the shelf. And one day we will take it and use it. But it's not there anymore. Some people argue that there needs to be a more drastic change in mindset to one that's more realistic about the current situation, where you've got one state, the state of Israel, that has almost total control over Palestinian life and enforces a system of discrimination that human rights groups describe as apartheid. The argument goes, why not focus on fixing that with a one-state solution? So rather than dividing the land, you focus on how to govern it and ensure everyone's rights are protected, regardless of their religion or ethnicity. We have a one state. We don't have to create it. 
We have to create a new regime, only to turn it from an apartheid system to a, to a democracy. I don't want to oversimplify it. It's, right now, it seems unthinkable. It's not like we will do a magic and this will work. But at least I can see a road somewhere. Oftentimes, people talk in terms of escapism. Oh, this will be undone with the one state solution. It will be undone with uh, a two state solution. But what we really need to focus on is ending that violence. Will Palestinians, do they want to have their own separate entity, their own separate state? Certainly some do. But the vast majority are not looking to have a state. The vast majority are looking to have that their rights are enshrined and protected. And that's got to be the starting point. We've done lots of other explainers related to Israel and Palestine. Here's one we filmed in East Jerusalem. This one is all about the U.S.-Israel relationship. 